you, Lord. Welcome to the weekly service from the Elim Church in the Home Valley. I know that tonight we are going to be blessed by the Word of God. We're going to go home encouraged and built up as we become more like Him and have a greater revelation of His love for us. Amen. And right now we pray for our loved ones, those special to us, those in our family, our husbands, our wives, our children, our grandchildren, our best friends. Father, we pray that your love and your grace and your mercy will flow in their lives, meeting their deepest need. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Gal. Good evening. I'm going to read you some truths of Scripture. God had you in his heart before time began. That's 2 Timothy 1 9. God desires fellowship with you. That is 1 Corinthians 1 9. God's love for you compelled him to give himself for you. That's John 3.16. God has prepared eternity for you. That's John 14, verses 2 and 3. God's desire is that you know and believe and receive his life. John 10.10. And God, who has promised all this to you, is faithful. Hebrews 10.23. We're going to start this evening with among the gods, there is none like you. O oh Lord, there are no deeds to compare with yours, O oh Lord. He is awesome, and it is so good to be his children and belong to him and to know him. Hallelujah. Let's worship him.
you that you are so good. Lord, when we think for all you have done for us, who you are, your holiness, your awesomeness, your power, and yet you have loved us with an everlasting love. You came, you died for us, you have prepared a place in eternity for us, with you forever. And even now, you inhabit your people. You live in us by your spirit. You lead us and guide us every day. You fellowship with us. You don't leave us just to get on with life, but you're right here with us every day. You never leave us or forget about us. Lord, we love you. Great is thy faithfulness.
Hallelujah. I am chosen, not forsaken. Hallelujah. Some of us need to know that, that we're chosen, that God is for us, not against us. Us here, you at home. Oh, thank you, Jesus, that you chose me, that you loved me, that you went to the cross and you died for me and you promised never to leave me nor forsake me. You're not angry with me. You love me. You're not against me. You're for me. You're on my side. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Just want to share something that really hit me while we were singing those songs tonight. We sang, Great is Thy Faithfulness. And we sang the line, All I have needed, yeah. Thy hand hath provided. And I just think it's important that we get hold of that tonight. But I want to add to that. Yeah. It's not all I have needed, His hand has provided. It's all I now need, His hand is providing. Yeah. And all I will need, His hand will provide for me. And it doesn't matter if right now you're living your very best life or you're living what feels like a living nightmare, he has everything you need. He will provide everything you need. You don't have to beg for it. You don't have to grovel for it. You just have to accept it, reach out and take it because it's there for you and it's there for your taking. Whatever you need, he will give you. Yeah. Just believe that. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. And I'm reminded of that scripture, how much God loves to give good gifts to his children. We're his children. You're his child. Amen. And he's not going to leave you in the lurch. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Um, Mark Greenwood. Friday the 24th of February at Honley Liberal Club. Seven o'clock. It's going to be a great evening. Uh, very good communicator. I've known him for 30 odd years. I know that some of you already know him. And uh, we're going to be blessed. Bring your unsaved friends uh, to that. He's a very good communicator of the gospel and expect them to be saved. So that's a week next Friday. So that's, that's going to be good. Some uh, food with that. Um, I did send out the email. I know that not everybody who gets the email reads it and not everybody gets an email. But just also to say the church uh, has been given £10,000 from central government funds. It's come through a third party. But anyway, we've got £10,000 to help people with their electricity bills and gas bills, um, to help people with food parcels, supermarket shopping, to help people repair their washing machine or their cooker if it's gone wrong. Uh, so it's a sizable amount of money. Um, we've got to spend it. We've got to deliver this grant, if you like, by the 24th of March, which is not long. So we've got about five weeks to not get rid of it, but deliver it is the word. So if you know anybody in need, anybody who would benefit from um, a, a food voucher, we've got some Audi gift cards coming uh, that we're going to give away. They do some that you can just buy food with and not alcohol. So that's excellent. So there, if you know anybody in need, let me know. We'll make sure that uh, that need is met. As I say, we've got £10,000 to, to use. We have <laughs> spent quite a lot in the last two days. But um, anyway, we're blessed. And God is good. All right. So let's get on to the message that I should have preached last week, but I was so long winded in finishing off my previous week's message that I never got round to it. So without further ado, let's get on to Mark 3, 20 to 21. Then Jesus entered a house and again a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him for they said he is out of his mind. So Jesus is, uh, uh, so far, has had a ministry of healing people, um, uh, healing the leper, the, the man that was paralysed, he was casting out demons and going around healing people, and he's gathering quite a crowd. And you can imagine that news is getting back to Nazareth and the family. What's Jesus up to? Oh, he's healed somebody today. They lowered somebody through the roof. 
Good dearie me. And then what's, been, what's he been up to today? Well, he's, he's been preaching in the synagogue and he's, he's told the, the, the rabbis about the, the Sabbath and the, how the Sabbath is, is, is made for man and not man for the Sabbath. And he's preaching them, preaching and he's amazing them. Oh, strike a light, they're probably saying to themselves. Um, casting out demons, what is he going to do next? So, so they might be getting a little bit embarrassed back up back in Nazareth and wondering whatever he's going to get up to next. And news gets back that he's preaching and there's a whole crowd following him and he's so pressed in from every angle that he can't even eat. And at Nazareth, the family had a meeting and they said, right, that's it. I think we better go and rein him in. Let's go and collect Jesus bring him back home before he embarrasses us anymore and causes any more trouble. Anybody had a, had a, had a teenage uh, 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 son or daughter in their family that they've had to go and rescue from town because they got word that they were an embarrassment and they thought we better go and rescue them. This was the kind of situation that the family felt. We better go and get Jesus before he does any harm to himself. Of course, they didn't understand. They thought that he was a lunatic. Now, that's my introduction to this passage here. Before I go on to say something else, now about C.S. Lewis. Because C.S. Lewis, the Narnia chap and the Lion, Witch and the Wardrobe chap, um, he wrote a book called Mere Christianity. In one of those chapters of, of that book, what it, it was entitled, Is Jesus a Liar, Lunatic or Lord? And so today I thought, well, let's have a think about this. Is Jesus a lunatic? Is he mad? I don't know about this as well, because uh, we can apply this. Um, we can think about these things as well. We're gonna, I shall apply it to ourselves, because how many people have said, you are mad because you believe in Jesus? You're mad, you flat earth person. <laughs> you crazy person, you, 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 you person who believes in God and doesn't believe in science. You had that kind of thing that people have said to you. Um, anyway, let's get back to my notes because I'm, 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 I'm drifting. But the New Testament is written to make clear that Jesus is not crazy. Jesus is not out of his mind. Lunatics don't heal people. Lunatics don't cast out demons and set people free. Lunatics don't raise the dead. Lunatics don't speak words of wisdom. Love your enemies. Give and it shall be given back to you. Crazy people can't do all the things that Jesus did. Crazy people are generally people that are all over the place. You know, when, <laughs> when somebody is crazy, they're, they're out of their mind. They can't concentrate. They're, they're thinking about one thing here and one thing there and doing one thing there and one thing there and all over the place, never consistent. But Jesus is consistent with everything he says. Crazy people are forever changing their minds. Jesus never changes his mind about anything. He is who he says he is and his word is eternal. His word never changes. People perhaps have said to us that we are mad. What's the best thing that we can reply with? You know, rather than getting in an argument with them. I think the best way that we can demonstrate that we are not mad is by living a consistent lifestyle that says, when things go wrong in our lives, we don't fall apart like an MFI wardrobe. <laughs> When things go wrong in our lives, we maintain a peace. We, we have joy in our lives when things are messy in our lives. And that when there is a need in our lives, when, when, when everybody else is in a panic, we are calm because we are trusting in our God who is faithful. 
I think that when we demonstrate such a lifestyle, nobody can point the finger that we are mad. Seeing the impossible being made possible in response to your prayers. When they see your life is steady and sure, when they discover trusting in themselves has just led to their lives ending up a mess, then they will agree that you are not mad and that you are the only sane person that they know. Hallelujah. Now, the second opinion about Jesus is presented by the scribes. They were theological heavyweights from Jerusalem. They, they knew calling uh, Jesus crazy wouldn't work, so they claimed that he was um, lying about his real source of power. These people were more thinkers, and they probably thought to themselves, no, 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 we can't say that that Jesus is a lunatic because crazy people don't go around healing people. Crazy people don't go around raising the dead. They couldn't deny the supernatural that they saw before themselves, so they had to accuse him about the source of his power. They didn't accuse him of being crazy, they accused him of being a liar. You are not God, you're of the devil. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, he is Beelzebub, by the ruler of demons, he has cast out demons. Now, Beelzebub was regarded as the prince of demons. He was the um, godfather of the demonic, if you like. But then Jesus, with wisdom, addresses their, their, their accusation. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. An army doesn't fight against itself. Jesus is more or less saying, if I were Satan, it makes no sense in destroying Satan. I am not a liar. I am genuine. I am who I say I am. I have come to destroy the works of the evil one. In his book, Cold Christianity, a chap called J. Warner Wallace, who was a, a former cold case homicide detective, lists three types of motives that lie at the heart of any misbehavior. Anybody who is not genuine, anybody who is peddling a false agenda. So he asks the question, is Jesus mad? Is he, is, he, is he a liar? Is he peddling a false agenda? Is he someone who he says he is not? Is he not, have I got that right? Is he someone else to who he says he is? You understand what I'm trying to say? <laughs> and he says, there are three types of motives that lie at the heart of any misbehavior. One, financial greed. Two, sexual or relational desire. And thirdly, pursuit of power. And he applies these sort of tests to Jesus. Was there, was there a financial motive behind Jesus? Um, Healing people, casting out demons. Was Jesus motivated by financial greed? Jesus taught his disciples to give their possessions to the needy, not to store up treasures in this life, but to store up treasures in heaven. Jesus never profited, profited from his healing or his preaching. So we could say he was not motivated by financial greed. Was he motivated by sex or, or relationships? No, his, 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 uh, he, he had exemplary relationships with all people, including the many women that he followed. There is simply no evidence that Jesus was motivated by any sexual desire. Or was he, pursuit, uh, was he motivated by the pursuit of power? Well, think about what Jesus said. For that even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus' ministry was all about servanthood. He didn't go around saying, come and serve me. He went around serving others. Here's an application for us. Let no one accuse us of being motivated by money, by being motivated by sexual relationships or being motivated by power. 
Let us be honest in our pursuit of God and our worship of him. So I don't believe that we can call Jesus a lunatic. He's not mad. He's not crazy. He can, no one crazy can do the things that Jesus did. And we're not crazy if we're consistently believing in Jesus in our lives. Jesus is not a liar. He is who he says he is. He is Lord. When people were trying to figure out Jesus' identity, Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. After his, re after his resurrection, um, to doubting Thomas saw the resurrected Jesus and he said, my Lord and my God. Here's the question for us. Who do you say Jesus is? Is he a liar? Is he a lunatic? If he's neither of those, is he Lord of your life? Amen. Amen. I'm going to do a Kath Taylor. Spontaneously sing a song together. He is Lord. You know that song? He is Lord. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead. And he is Lord. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. He is Lord. That was where I was going to end up last week. But let's start this week right now <laughs> and look at the parable of the sower. I won't get through all the parable, but I'll, I'll get through as much as I can and we'll stop at a, a, a place that's relevant. The parable of the sower. Possibly it should be called the parable of the soils because it's about the different soils rather than about the person that sowed it. But that's a, being pedantic, perhaps. A parable is an illustration alongside a truth. It's an earthly story with a spiritual meaning. It's a physical illustration of a spiritual concept. And we will look at the text as we go along. I won't read the whole passage because already time is escaping us. So we'll look at it um, as we go along. All right, so verse three of chapter four says this, listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. Listen, now, <laughs> exclamation mark, behold. Now, I've talked about the word behold before, haven't I? Because when the word behold is used in the scripture, it's telling us just to stop and think and take note because what follows is very important. Listen up, Jesus says, behold. If we were writing today, we would write in bold, we would underline, we'd write in red, or we'd write with fluorescent pen. The way that the uh, scripture writers used to highlight something was not by that method but it was by using this word behold behold so what Jesus is about to say is theologically important and it is important for us to understand and not miss listen up he who has an ear to hear let him hear a sower went out to sow. The seed is the word of God. The sower is the person who is broadcasting the word of God. That might be a preacher, as I'm doing right now, but it might be you who might be broadcasting the word of God, spreading the word of God in your own way, maybe in a personal conversation, maybe something that you've written, maybe even in your lifestyle as we were looking at last week, because our life can be a message. So we're broadcasting the word of God. 
And it happened as he sowed that some seed fell by the wayside and the birds of the air came and devoured it. The truth was declared, but the birds of the air came and snatched the seed. The word was declared, but the enemy came and stole that seed that was to bear fruit, that is intended to bear fruit in your life. Do you know what? The enemy has one thing that he hates, and that is for you to discover the truth of the word of God. He doesn't want to know that you're loved. He doesn't want you to know that you're chosen. He doesn't want you to know that all things are provided and will be provided and have been provided. He doesn't want you to know peace. He doesn't want you to know joy. He doesn't want you to know eternal life. He doesn't want you to know that you are blessed. And so he will come and snatch that word before you have the opportunity to digest it, to get it into your heart and for it to make a difference, for it to bear fruit. And it's scattered by the wayside. And, you know, I was thinking about this. Well, how can we apply this? I think that the enemy sometimes would come and distract us from receiving the word of God. When the word is preached, there are all kinds of distractions that the enemy sends to stop us absorbing that which God has for us. Now, I've spoken about this before, that, you know, when you sit down and read a newspaper, you don't get the kind of distractions that you get when you sit down and read the Bible. When you sit in church, sometimes there are all kinds of distractions. You're thinking about what's written on those plaques over there. We can read them later. <laughs> You're wondering what what so-and-so's wearing and where they bought that from. You're, what you're thinking to yourself, uh, so-and-so's had their hair cut on or who's got that perfume on or, or even what am I having for supper when I get back home? All kinds of things that you are thinking about that is distracting you from receiving that which God has for you. You know, I, I remember in the past there was a, a lady that, that, that used to wander about at the back of the church and she used to fiddle about with the notices and fiddle about with all the bits and the pieces that were on the back table and she'd pick them up and she'd drop them and they'd go all over the floor and everybody would look back and see what was happening and, and everything like was this. And, you know, we'd be thinking, just sit still for a minute, from, won't you? And I think sometimes the enemy would come and, and want to distract us from receiving the goodness of God that he has for us. It tells me something, that we need to be intentional about listening. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear, says verse 13 later on. I think I'm drifting from my notes here, but I'll, I'll carry on. But if you think about it, um, <laughs> I think we can all identify with this. We've all got had children, grandchildren, or you can identify with it if you've not got grandchildren or children because you can identify it because you've been like it yourself at some point. And that is when you've been getting ready to go to bed, you, you're there and, and you're, you're in your pyjamas and you've got your dressing gown on and you're just playing with your toys and, and it's, time is coming up to the time when you should be going to bed. And your mum or your, or your father will say to you, uh, Ian, it's time to go to bed. And how many of you have said that to your child? It's time to go to bed. And they carry on as if they have never heard you. You see, the point that I'm trying to make is, is that we can hear the word, but sometimes it cannot sink in. We're not really listening. So what I'm saying here is that we need to be intentional about listening so that when we hear God's voice, we don't say, oh, I'm too busy doing my own thing. Let me just finish this off. When God speaks, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear. Listen up. Well, there's a practical application for us. But then I was thinking about um, this um, uh, here. here um, Oh, I, I'm 
all over the place with my notes now. Um, 2 Corinthians 4, 3, 4 says this, but even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. So we're thinking here about the seed not being absorbed and doing its job and bearing fruit and how there are many distractions from it and we're not listening and we're not understanding. Uh, Paul gives us for the unbeliever this point that the enemy is blinding the eyes of the unbeliever so that they do not see the truth of the gospel. The gospel is veiled. And it can be that they hear the word, but the enemy does his best at stopping that word making a difference in their lives. He puts a veil over it so that they don't understand. And so one of the things that we can pray for our unbelieving friends, our unbelieving members of the family, is that we can bind the enemy and say, in the name of Jesus, you are bound enemy. You have no authority to blind them and put a veil over their eyes anymore. Father, I pray that they would see the light of the gospel in Jesus' name. And it's something that we can be praying, especially for our friends and our family who are coming to hear Mark Greenwood in a couple of weeks' time. So that's one way that the enemy <clears throat> can steal the word of the Lord. But then I've got to find where I am in my notes now because I've, <laughs> I've gone all over the place now. Um, yes, th there's another scripture that I've got here. Instead of being, uh, instead of sort of, we need to be intentional as we listen to the Lord because the enemy will try and snatch it away. And we can also pray for revelation of that word as well. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with life so that you can understand the confident hope that is given to those he called. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him, the same Christ who raised Jesus Christ, the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. So in other words, not only can we pray that the unbeliever will see the light, but also that we will see the light and that the enemy will not distract us, okay. Then likewise are the ones sown on stony ground who, when they hear the word of God, immediately receive it with gladness, and when they have no root in themselves, and so endure only, f and, and so endure only for a time. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. Immediately they receive it with gladness. Hallelujah. They receive the fact that God loves them. They raise their voices with a shout. They do a cartwheel as they, they go out the church. They do a, a, a run, skip and a jump. I'm healed. I know that God has forgiven me. I know that I'm loved. I know that I'm chosen. They're delighted. They are glad at the revelation that they have received from the word of God. But then it says, when tribulation or persecution comes for the sake of the word, then they stumble. It causes them to stumble. So they might go out with a, 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 a run, skip and a jump on a Sunday night and they might say, hallelujah, I'm forgiven. And then by the morning, the enemy comes whispering in them, in their ears, something goes wrong in their lives and they say, they say to themselves, I thought God was for me, God must be against me. Um, I thought that God loved me. If the, all these horrible things were happening in my life, this, all these horrible things are happening in my life, if God really loved me, they wouldn't happen. Well, we've got to recognise it's the enemy that's coming against us. He's wanting to steal the word. He's wanting to, to, to steal that joy from our lives. It's the enemy that comes to kill, steal and destroy. And Satan says, I'll soon knock that smile off their face. <laughs> 
I'll send them trouble. I'll get a family to tell them that they are crackers, that they're out of their mind, that they're a flat earther, that they're silly if they believe in the word of God. And immediately they stumble. They're no longer standing firm on the rock of God's word. They've listened to other people or they have allowed circumstances to make them give up. You now it's interesting, isn't it, you know, that people can go to church for years and then suddenly something can go wrong in their lives and they'll say, well, I can't believe God anymore. Let's not allow the enemy to hoodwink us into believing something that is not the word of God. That's his uh, motive. But then I want you to notice that the word stumble in the authorised version, or no, the revised version, revised standard version, is the, is, um, uh, the word offence. They are glad that they are forgiven. They are glad that God loves them. They are glad that they have peace. They are glad that they have eternal life. They're glad about God's goodness. And then somebody says something that causes offence. You know, people get offended over silly things sometimes. People get offended over the way that I frown or, or something. They said to me, Ian, I notice when you don't agree with somebody that you frown. So next time I frowned in their presence, they thought that I was disagreeing with them. Oh, no, it's nice, just the fact that I'm expressing my face. No, I get offended over what colour tie I wear or what colour cardigan I've got. I get offended over all kinds of things. And I, I mentioned the other week that, that my mother, God bless her, she used to get offended at all kinds of things that people used to say to her in the church. Even though they didn't mean it when they said that the flowers were a sight for sore eyes, she thought that it was an insult rather than a compliment. She took offence and she stayed off church for a whole month. She allowed the enemy to steal her joy, steal her peace, steal her contentment, her faith in God. This is like the word sown on the stony ground. The devil does not want to see, wasn't you, doesn't want you to know that you are healed, forgiven, restored, at peace, with joy, with hope, with eternal life. Why are things getting, going wrong in your life? Why is the enemy sending all these disasters and things to make you get offended, to cause you to stumble, to stop you trusting him, to get you discouraged? He wants to stop you being glad and he wants you to be mad. He doesn't want you to be glad at God, he wants you to be mad at God. This is what Jesus is saying. The most important thing in life is that you intentionally listen, get a revelation of who I am, and that you get a greater understanding. Second most important thing is that you don't take offence. Don't get mad with others. Don't get mad at God. Don't get mad at the government. Don't get offended with your spouse or your kids, because that is how Satan steals the seed. I notice time has gone and I'll probably wrap this up here. Just a word about offence, that when somebody says something to you that might cause you to be discouraged, that might take you, might cause you to go off in a huff, we just need to let it go, let it go. Psalm 119, 165 says this, great peace have those who love your law and nothing causes them to stumble. Nothing causes them to be offended. Great peace have those who love your seed, love your word. Great peace. Why is nothing going to offend me? Because I love your word and I'm interested in bearing fruit in my life for his glory, more than winning an argument. I'm not gonna rise to Satan's bait. I'm not gonna fall into that trap. 
And sometimes people can get offended at people, they can get upset, they can go off in a huff and they can say, well, so-and-so did this to me, so-and-so did that to me. Just let it go. Let it go. Even if it pains you that someone has got, off, got away with an injustice and you think that they need a taste of their own medicine, I'm going to rise above it because I am not going to allow the enemy to steal me. I'm not going to allow the devil to steal the harvest that God has for me. I could go on, but I notice it's already almost five past seven, so I'll leave it there. So we've done two, two messages tonight, or one and a half messages. Jesus is not a lunatic, he's not crazy, he's not a liar. Let's make sure that he is Lord of our lives. And let's demonstrate to the world around us that we are not crazy, but we are the only sane people around them because we trust God and we don't fall apart when things go wrong in our lives. Let's make sure that we are people who are genuine people, who aren't motivated by money or sex or power, but motivated by the love of our Lord. Let's make him Lord of our lives. And then also let's, make it in, let's be intentional about listening to the word of God. Let's be intentional about when he speaks, not to ignore him. Let's be intentional about not being distracted, but making sure that we are focused in listening to his word and what he has to say, for, say to us, because the enemy wants to steal that from us. Let's be intentional about not stumbling and not being offended by people. The enemy will send disasters and um, uh, discouragements our way, because the last thing that he wants us to do is to trust in him. And as we trust in him, see that blessing that he has for us bear fruit in our lives. Let's be firm in looking to God, seeking God, looking to him for that revelation, praying to him for that revelation, and then also praying for our friends who are unbelievers, that God's light might shine on them and bind in the enemy in Jesus' name. Next week, we'll pray specifically for those that we're inviting to our Mark Greenwood event so that the light of the gospel will shine on their lives. But that's next week. You'll have to come next week for next week's instalment. But right now, we'll sing one last song, which is, Lord, I lift your name on high.
we lift the name of Jesus high and we declare that he is Lord of our lives. Hallelujah. We're meeting, we're meeting this week for Cafe Groups this Tuesday and Thursday. Uh, we'd be glad to see you there. If you've not made it this week, uh, we've missed you. We hope to see you again very soon. Uh, we haven't forgotten you and we're praying for you. Uh, if you want to call me at home, it's 01484 323 978. If you want to ring my mobile, it's 0747 277 3243. If you want to email me, it's info at hvelim.org.uk. Oh, do not allow the enemy to steal the seed of God's word, the seed of God's truth to your life this week. Remember that you are loved, that you are chosen, that God has provided everything that you need, both now and in the future. And remember that you are blessed, blessed by the best. Amen. See you again soon. Bye for now.